My topic today is entrepreneurship and economic progress, and I want to start out thinking about this idea of economic progress, which is a relatively new idea. Uh, it's only within the past several hundred years that people would have had any idea of economic progress in their lifetimes. We stop to think about it. The Industrial Revolution started around 1750 or so, and before that time, people wouldn't have noticed any economic progress during their lifetimes. Uh, life wasn't that much different for most people in 1750 than in 1650. Wasn't that much different in 1650 from 1550. In fact, it wasn't that much different for people in 1550 than it was for people in 550. That uh, they would have consumed about the same types of goods. They would have engaged in about the same types of productive processes. So it really wouldn't have been that much of a shock for a typical person, let's say, living in 550 A.D., uh, to have taken a long sleep and woken up in 1550. Sure, some things would have been different, but a lot of life would have been the same. And for, for most of history, economic progress would have been unnoticed in a person's lifetime. The economic world you were born in was the economic world that you would die in. Now, sure, individual circumstances could change. People, individuals could prosper. Individuals could fall on hard times and so forth. But, but for, uh, for, for the economic system in general, as I say, uh, until very recently in history, people would have not have noticed economic progress in their lifetimes. Then the Industrial Revolution comes along. And uh, so uh, change starts accelerating, and so uh, economic progress becomes more and more rapid until it's easy to notice economic progress during your lifetime. It's easy to notice economic progress uh, just in a few years. Um, now, I, um, when I'm talking to my students about this, uh, one thing that I use as an example, maybe it's like the time period is getting longer and longer, because this, this is my 21st year at Florida State, so wow, that's a long time. Um, but when I got there, I only knew one person who had a cell phone. Uh, and, and there was a good reason why the person used his phone uh, in business a lot, and it actually wasn't one he carried around. It was attached to his car. Uh, but he said it was great for business because he would, tra was, like, travel in his car during the day. And he said, well, during the day, you know, when I'm in my car, it's just like dead time for me. But now I've got the phone in my car, and so I can make business calls, and so all that time is productive time. But I knew why not that many people had cell phones. He had a cell phone bill of about $500 a month. So it was just out of reach of, of most people. And like I say, outside of this one person, I didn't know anybody who had a cellular telephone. Uh, and I can remember being surprised uh, a, a little bit when after class, you know, I'd see students leaving class and they'd just get out their phones and they'd be talking on their phones. But I'm not surprised anymore because isn't that what you all do when you leave class? You just open up that phone, and you're on the phone uh, calling somebody. Uh, and so uh, now uh, everybody has them. Is there anybody in here who does not have a cell phone? No, nobody. But 20 years ago, nobody would have had one. Um, uh, you know, uh, the Internet that we just take for granted, uh, the World Wide Web... Uh, came into being in 1992. Um, uh, the Internet's been around a little bit longer than that. Al Gore invented the Internet before that. But the World Wide Web that we're so used to, uh, 1992. Um, and, uh, uh, I, and I remember uh, one of my kids telling me one time, he says, Dad, I just can't imagine what life would be like without the Internet. So, um, so, this, so economic progress has accelerated so much that uh, in a period of a decade or two, there's been more economic progress in your lifetime than, than there would have been in centuries if you go back before the Industrial Revolution. So 
so it's just it's pretty remarkable how this economic progress has taken place, and we just we just kind of take it for granted. We take economic progress for granted these days. <clears throat> Let me tell you an amazing little story here. This is just incredible. Listen, listen to this. Um, now, um, as uh, Dr. Cardin told you, uh, I live in Tallahassee, Florida. Uh, let me tell you how I got here. I climbed into this aluminum cylinder, and I traveled six miles above the surface of the earth at 550 miles an hour to get here. Okay, now let me tell you the amazing thing about it. Nobody's surprised that I did this. Right? Everybody's, oh yeah, he took the airlines. We just take it for granted that miracles like this are possible. If I was going to make this trip a hundred years ago, I'd get on the train and it would take me a day so, uh, to get here, maybe, maybe longer. If I were to do this 200 years ago, um, I don't know, I've either uh, would have gone overland by horse and wagon uh, or maybe by sea. You know, just could have come up the Mississippi uh, here. It, you know, it would have taken me weeks or months to make this trip. Uh, and nowadays, you know, we just take it for granted. Yeah, you just get on the airlines and go. Uh, you know, and it, it's so remarkable what the airlines are able to do that if your flight's late by a couple of hours, then you're upset, you know. What is wrong with this company that they can't get this aluminum cylinder up in the air, six miles up in the air, uh, you know, within uh, a couple of minutes of when they said they were going to do it? So it's just, it's remarkable the amount of economic progress that's, that's taken place. And we just, we take it for granted, you know. So the first thing I want to do is to get you to think a little bit about, yeah, this is really amazing, the amount of economic progress that's taken place. So why is it that we've had this amazing amount of economic progress just in relatively recently in the past 250 years or so uh, when if you go back thousands of years before that, we, you know, economic progress was essentially imperceptible. Now, it's not that there wasn't any economic progress uh, because, um, you know, certainly when you look at the standard of living of people who lived in ancient Rome, for example, was well above like primitive caveman standards of living. Uh, so they, you know, there was a pretty advanced society there. But yet it seems that economic progress stopped and didn't resume again until the Industrial Revolution. So why is that? It had to do with the development of the market economy. If you look around the world at the economic progress that we've seen, countries that have adopted a market economy and market institutions are countries that have prospered. Countries that haven't adopted market institutions haven't prospered. Right, So you just look around the world. You look at, uh, at the United States. You look at Western Europe. You look at Japan. What is it that's made these countries wealthy? They have market economies. And you look at places in the world that are mired in poverty, stuck in poverty. What is it that, that they have in common? They have not adopted market institutions. Right? And, and you can see it. Uh, like, for example, uh, a couple of the fastest growing economies in the world now are India and China. Why is it that they were so poor only a few decades ago and now they're growing so rapidly? It's because they're uh, adopting market institutions and with market institutions, it's possible to have this economic progress. After World War II, we undertook this uh, experiment. We divided Germany into two countries. East Germany and West Germany. West Germany with a market economy. East Germany, centrally planned economy. 
Same people, same culture, same language. The difference is a different set of institutions imposed on the people in West Germany and East Germany. We did the same thing in Korea. It's divided Korea into North Korea and South Korea. Same people, same language, same culture, but as a result of war, divided them into two economies. One, South Korea, a market economy. The other, North Korea, centrally planned economy. And in both cases, the countries that had the market economies grew, thrived, and prospered. The countries that had the centrally planned economies didn't. So today, as North Korea is one of the, or South Korea is one of the wealthier countries in the world, North Korea is one of the poor countries in the world. What's the difference? It's market institutions. You know, um, you know in Germany, uh, you know, gosh, back when I was in college, a long time ago, uh, during the Cold War, uh, you know, there, there, these tensions between East and West, the Berlin Wall is kind of the flashpoint of those tensions, and you could easily picture this boiling over, as, you know, into maybe some kind of hostilities until eventually one side took over the other. And that happened, but without a war, without firing any, uh, any of the nuclear missiles or anything. Uh, you know, what won the Cold War for the West. It was a superior economic system. As information got across the Berlin Wall and into the Eastern Bloc, people saw the standards of living that were enjoyed by people in the West compared to their standards of living. They overthrew their governments because they wanted a different system. They wanted that market economy. Um, so, uh, so we see that economic progress occurs in places that have market economies, places that don't, uh, don't have market economies. So why is it then that, um, that uh, economic progress started up around uh, in the middle of the 1700s uh, in Britain with the, with the Industrial Revolution? Uh, well, there's a lot of complicated economic history here, but some of the key features that we have in market economies didn't really exist before then. Uh, a lot of it had to do with uh, markets for factors of production, the way the factors of production were uh, organized. Now, there have been markets for, you know, for centuries and centuries, and people have traded, you know, the uh, ancient Phoenicians trading on the Mediterranean Sea and so forth. So people have, have traded and, and exchanged throughout history, but you didn't have a market economy where most people uh, made their living uh, producing things for other people, exchanging in a market economy, uh, that uh, most economic activity was uh, centrally planned from above, that people who got wealthy in uh, economies prior to the Industrial Revolution got wealthy by taking from the production of others rather than consuming the wealth that they themselves uh, produced. And uh, along with the Industrial Revolution, I mean, with the, the factors that underlie the Industrial Revolution, one of the key things was the development of markets for factors of production. That uh, prior to the Industrial Revolution, uh, there wasn't very much of a market in land. Wealthy people had big estates, and they'd keep those estates in their family as long as they could. Under duress, they might be forced to part with some of their land, but nor, you didn't have a market where people bought and sold uh, land as they do today. You didn't have a market for labor the same way that you have labor markets today. Uh, that um, uh, uh, labor tended to work partly under a command-type system. Uh, the Roman Empire was built on a slave-type economy. Uh, in feudalism, uh, you had feudal serfs uh, who were working for their feudal lords. 
uh, even as cities began to form in uh, Europe around like 1050 to 1150 AD, uh, labor markets were heavily regulated by guilds. Uh, you had to be a guild member to produce, and in order to be a guild member, you first had to be an apprentice. Uh, and all of these labor relations, there are other responsibilities that go into the relationship besides just an exchanging of labor for wages. Um, you know, if you're a guild master and you're taking on apprentices, uh, well, that might be a good source of, uh, of cheap labor, but you also have a responsibility to take care of your apprentices. Uh, and so it's uh, potentially costly to take on that labor. Uh, if you're a feudal lord and you have all your feudal serfs working for you, uh, or in a slave economy, the workers don't have very much of an incentive to be productive because the more productive they are, well, the returns just go to the feudal lords, to the slave owners. Uh, and at the same time, uh, those people have uh, obligations and responsibilities to the people they're working for, uh, that the feudal lord has a responsibility to take care uh, of those serfs, even in a slave economy where the slaves are, are property, they're valuable, and so you have an incentive to to uh, maintain and take care of your valuable property. So there are complicated labor relationships that uh, as the Industrial Revolution came along, uh, those uh, relationships fell by the wayside and people could simply exchange labor for wages. So a labor market uh, developed. Uh, and the same thing is true for capital. There, there were not well-developed capital markets prior to the Industrial Revolution. So people who amassed a lot of wealth didn't have a good way to take that wealth and turn around and invest it in productive activity. So they might buy luxury goods or uh, aggrandize their estate or something like that because there weren't well-developed capital markets where, where uh, people could invest uh, the wealth that they had. Uh, but uh, uh, one of the things that happened uh, that laid the foundation for the Industrial Revolution was the... Uh, the um, development of capital markets. Uh, in the early 1600s, uh, the, uh, the uh, early development of, the, of capital markets occurred in Amsterdam. Uh, and uh, one of the first publicly traded companies was the Dutch East Indies Company. Uh, and, uh, the, and the capital market, it didn't develop by plan where somebody said, I've got a great idea, let's start a stock market. Uh, but what happened was... Um, People would send out sailing ships from uh, Amsterdam uh, to, uh, uh, with goods that they could trade, and then uh, some months or years later, uh, if all went well, uh, those ships would come back with uh, valuable goods on them, and then the owners of the ships uh, would have a handsome profit to be made, assuming the ship came back. But a lot of them didn't. So it was a risky kind of venture, you know, because you could invest in sending your ship out, uh, and uh, if your ship came back, you could make money on it. If your ship didn't come back, you'd lose everything. So some of the enterprising uh, people in Amsterdam thought, why don't we pool our resources, and instead of, you know, I'm sending a ship out, you're sending a ship out, let's pool our resources, and we'll all get together and send a lot of ships out, and, you know, most of them will come back, some of them won't, but then we're not running a risk of taking big losses, and then when the ships come back, then we'll get our profit. So, uh, the Dutch East Indies Company started with this idea of essentially trying to pool risk by everybody getting together and, and sending a bunch of ships out rather than having to risk that your ship wouldn't come back. Um, so when the ships came back, uh, things worked out pretty well for them. And so uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, people who participated in the company said, well, wait a minute, rather than, than just cash in and take our money, let's take the money that we have and we'll, we'll use it to send more ships out. Uh, and and so, that, so that's what they did. But then if you wanted to get out, some people started selling their shares, and 
so uh, as the shares were being sold of the Dutch East Indies Company, a market developed, and so uh, the, um, uh, you started having a stock market, a capital market, uh, and then from there other firms started up where shares were traded uh, in the same way. So you had a well-developed capital market that, uh, that could match up people who had excess money to lend with other people who had business enterprises where they wanted to borrow. Okay. So, if you go back before the Industrial Revolution, you really didn't have well-developed markets for factors of production. Yes, people traded. People have been trading throughout history. But you didn't have well-developed markets for land, for labor, uh, and for capital. So, one of the things that we saw in the Industrial Revolution was the development of these, uh, of these factor markets. And... Uh, so why did this occur uh, in Britain and, and not in other places? Uh, well, of course, it, I mean, it did occur to a degree in other places. And as I mentioned, uh, capital markets started developing uh, in Amsterdam uh, before we saw similar markets in, in Britain. But Britain had a lot of advantages um, because they had a decentralized government. Uh, and because the government was relatively decentralized uh, in Britain, there was some intergovernmental competition to get businesses to locate uh, in one city relative to another. Uh, so uh, uh, the, the individual cities had uh, an incentive to look for ways to try to get enterprising people uh, to locate there. So they kept regulation low, they kept taxes low, and if things got out of line, businesses would leave so there was uh, so you could see uh, that that uh, there was an advantage to removing impediments to uh, business in in Britain um, the crown had relatively little power in Britain compared to uh, other countries in Europe and Britain also had a system of common law where the law was independent of the crown uh, so people had recourse to courts where there was an objective rule of law, where people f felt like they could be treated fairly under the law, everybody was treated the same under the law. Uh, it was um, uh, not that uncommon that the king actually could lose cases in Britain's common law courts. Uh, and so uh, one of the, uh, this is another key factor there in Britain is that uh, rule of law. And what I mean by rule of law is everybody's treated the same under the law. If you have rule of law, then enterprising people have an incentive to be productive because they'll feel like they can reap the fruits of their labor. So you need rule of law, you need a, a protection of private property rights, low barriers to exchange. Without rule of law, some people are treated more favorably under the legal system than others. And in cases like that, enterprising individuals have an incentive to find their way into positions of government favor so that they can profit not by being productive themselves, but by using the, their advantages under the law to take away from the productivity of others. So that reduces the incentive to be productive, uh, and it channels entrepreneurial activities away from productive activities toward predatory activities. If some individuals use their advantages under the law to have resources transferred to them from productive individuals. Now, one thing I want to distinguish is economic progress, which is in the title of my talk, from economic growth. Because uh, and I think this is a distinction that economists don't really make well enough. Uh, we talk about uh, economic growth uh, in our models. We talk about how much income has increased. And indeed, it's increased a lot. Um, in the United States, per capita income grew about seven times in the 20th century. So by the end of the 20th century people's incomes on average were about seven times higher than they were at the beginning of the 20th century. 
But if we just stop there, we're, we're really not recognizing a big part of economic progress. For one thing, a lot of the reason why our standard of living is higher now than it was 100 years ago or 50 years ago or 20 years ago I mean, partly it's because we have higher incomes, but also it's because we can buy different things with our incomes. We have things that are available to us now that weren't available to us 20 or 50 or 100 years ago. That, uh, as I already mentioned, 100 years ago, I would have had to take the train to get here in this trip. Now I can fly the airlines much quicker. 20 years ago, nobody had sell your telephones. Now, everybody has them. You know, computers, internet access, um, you know, the interstate highway system. Um, gosh, I've been around long enough. I can remember the first time I saw a microwave oven. This is amazing. But, uh, um, so, we talk about economic growth and how much our income has gone up. But that leaves out that economic progress, the, the different goods that we have available for us to buy that have increased our standard of living. Uh, and of course, I mean, I haven't even talked about the remarkable advances in health care, uh, the drugs, the surgical procedures and so forth uh, that have enhanced our quality of life. I mean, so there's, a, there's so many dimensions in which we've seen economic progress outside of just the growth in income. So that's one thing that we want to recognize uh, is that component of economic progress beyond just the fact that we have higher incomes. But another reason that we really need to recognize it is that incomes couldn't have grown that much were it not for this economic progress. People at the end of the 20th century wouldn't have had any reason to have seven times as much food as they did at the beginning of the 20th century, although they were eating more. Um, people at the end of the 20th century wouldn't have had any good reason to have seven times as many horses as they had at the beginning of the 20th century. So if the goods that we consumed didn't change there wouldn't have been the same impulse for the growth in total income. Because one of the reasons income has grown is because people have had the opportunity to consume new, improved, different goods that weren't available before. So actually it's economic progress that drives this income growth, and the income growth would not have been possible without the economic progress uh, to go along with it. So, where does this economic progress come from? Uh, in a word, entrepreneurship. That I've talked a little bit about the environment of entrepreneurship, protecting property rights, rule of law, uh, low tax regulatory barriers, and so forth. Within this environment, people have an incentive to look for profit opportunities, <laughs> because the, the entrepreneurs will be better off, but in a market economy, they have an incentive to look for ways that look for types of goods that they can produce, new production processes that make other people better off. Because when these entrepreneurs find these profit opportunities, they profit, but also the people who buy those uh, new, improved, or less expensive goods, they also benefit. So, when the institutional environment is right, entrepreneurship is what produces economic progress. An entrepreneur, you know, if we think about just briefly the role of entrepreneurship, what an entrepreneur does is seek and act on profit opportunities that haven't been exploited yet. So an entrepreneur says, "Boy, you know, here's a great idea for a good that that can be produced. You know, here's a here's a wonderful idea." Um, 
and uh, the entrepreneur will, you know, go into business, invest some capital, and produce some new good, use some new production method to make existing goods cheaper uh, to the benefit of the entrepreneur, but also to the benefit of uh, of people who consume the output of the entrepreneur. Um, Great 20th century economist Joseph Schumpeter made the distinction between invention and innovation. Uh, and invention, it was, you know, discovering some type of uh, process or just discovering a new good or something like that. Whereas innovation, the way Schumpeter described it, was bringing a marketable good to product, uh, to bringing a, 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 a marketable good to the market using that invention. A lot of you probably know that um, the computer mouse and the computer windowing system and so forth, that was invented by Xerox. Do we know that? Yeah. It was a Xerox company uh, that invented that type of Windows operating system with the windows on the screen and the mouse to use as the input device. Xerox never made a profitable product using that. But Steve Jobs saw how that worked and said, man, this would be a great interface for a computer. Designed, built the Macintosh, and, you know, he had an already successful company, uh, and and then here's another successful uh, product for his company. Bill Gates did the same thing, had a little bit of a different marketing strategy, but Bill Gates said, man, this Windows Windows operating system is a great way to run a computer. Uh, So he designed his Windows operating system that's uh, now on most personal computers that people are using. So the people at Xerox were the inventors, but it was Bill Gates and Steve Jobs who were the innovators, who were the entrepreneurs, who were able to take that invention and turn it into a profitable product. Uh, And those of us who are using computers now are better off because of it, because it's uh, it's, uh, easier to use those computers, uh, easier to work them. Um, When you look at the way a market economy operates, uh, I mean, in a sense, we... We way oversimplify it when we describe markets like with supply and demand and we talk about average costs and marginal costs and so forth. These ideas that may be familiar with some of you if you've had uh, some introductory economics courses. And you look at that theory of the firm, the way we teach it to our introductory students, And the people who run those firms in our models are managers. They're managers who try to minimize the cost of production for a given level of output, to find the profit-maximizing level of output. So, So when you look at what those firms are doing, we give them inputs. You know, they use like capital and labor to produce output and the people who are running the firms in those models they're managers who are trying to produce the profit maximizing output at the minimum possible cost (coughs) when you look at the way markets actually operate one of the characteristics of markets is economic progress So the firm doesn't just produce some output Q using inputs like K and L. 
it's up to the firm to decide, you know, what kind of output are we going to produce? What characteristics uh, of output are we going to produce in our product? Uh, what type of inputs do we need for our products? Is there any way we can find a way to get inputs more cheaply? And so uh, even in the most mundane markets, there's continual economic progress. The inputs into the production process aren't given. And the output in the production process isn't given. Now, you think about uh, an, an industry that you all are familiar with, the fast food industry, and the innovation that's taken place in, in the fast food industry. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, one of the larger firms in the industry now is McDonald's. Uh, and, you know, how do they get to be so, so big? There was an innovation there that uh, the former owner of McDonald's, Ray Kroc, saw. And, and you know, uh, Ray Kroc was not, he wasn't the owner of the original McDonald's restaurant. There actually were a couple of brothers, the McDonald brothers, who had a restaurant. Ray Kroc uh, was a restaurant supply guy who sold uh, restaurant equipment to restaurants. Uh, and... Uh, the McDonald's restaurant ordered a whole bunch of these milkshake uh, machines. And Ray Kroc is looking at this order and he says, what kind of restaurant needs this many milkshake makers? It's making this many milkshakes. So he goes to look at it personally and thinks, what a great idea these people have uh, in, this, uh, in this restaurant. Uh, and so uh, he ends up buying the restaurant from the McDonald Brothers. So, uh, you know, just like the Windows operating system, Ray Kroc wasn't the inventor, but he was the innovator who, who uh, uh, expanded the market and, and uh, sent McDonald's all over the world. What was the innovation? The innovation in McDonald's was make the food before the customers come to buy it. You know, that they were selling enough volume that they could predict how many hamburgers were going to be sold, you know, over this 15-minute period and so forth. So they'd make the food before the customers came so the customers could just walk up to a window and order their food and, and then they'd get that food through the window. So, uh, you know, it was really fast food because before that, most of the time when you went to a restaurant... You'd come and you'd sit down and you'd place an order. Then the waitress would go back and the cook would cook your order. Uh, but the, the innovation in McDonald's was have the food ready when the customers come to order it. Um, but McDonald's has changed a lot over the years. The first McDonald's, if you go back to the 1950s, uh, the first McDonald's, didn't, they didn't have any indoor seating area. Uh, it was a building where you'd walk up to a window. You'd be outside. And you'd walk up to a window. And you'd order through the window, and they'd hand your food to you uh, in the bag through the window. And uh, in the 1950s, when people were in love with their automobiles, they thought it was great to just take that sack of food, sit in their car, and and uh, and uh, eat the food, uh, but that's changed. So now uh, you know innovations have occurred. So to keep up with the market, uh, McDonald's has indoor seating. Their menus have changed too. I mean, originally with the McDonald's menu, uh, you could get hamburgers and cheeseburgers. Uh, they also had double hamburgers, double cheeseburgers. Um, but their menu has expanded. Uh, the the uh, the uh, uh, type of uh, offerings in the restaurant, the seating has uh, has changed, uh, and now I even I notice in my um, local McDonald's now they have all these specialty coffees. They have that in their offices, sort of like competing with uh, with Starbucks. Um, but uh, but the point of this is that um, you know even in a mundane industry like this, there's continual innovation. You know that entrepreneurs are always looking for new types of goods, new ways of production, uh, you know, better ways to satisfy customers. Uh, and if you don't do it, you're going to fall behind your competition. So, you know, then other companies have to get in and, and compete. So McDonald's comes up with uh, new product lines. Uh, Wendy's comes up with new product lines to compete with McDonald's. Um, uh, I... I think I figured out the secret at Wendy's of their uh, their innovation in their product lines. Uh, I, I think what it is 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 just add bacon to everything. So, is that I don't know. Is that, that's um, 
Because the other day I was into Wendy's uh, and I had the bacon frosty and it was... Um, <coughs> so, you see, the, the, the point is, you know, going back to this distinction that I want to make between entrepreneurship and management. If you look at the way that we depict the theory of the firm in our theories, the people who run firms are managers who are looking for the optimal combination of inputs and outputs. If you look in the real world, people who run firms are entrepreneurs. They're people who are looking for ways to innovate, to make their products more appealing to consumers, to lower their costs. And if you're a really entrepreneurial firm with bad management, you can stay ahead of your competition and survive and maybe prosper in the market. Better to have good management. But if you're entrepreneurial, you stay ahead of the, uh, of the market and you can thrive and prosper. If you're a firm that has great management but no entrepreneurship, sort of like the way we depict firms in our competitive model, you're destined to fail. Because other firms are going to innovate and pass you by. And you're going to lose your market share and eventually go out of business. So good management is important to a firm. Entrepreneurship is essential to the survival of a firm. And we, we don't do a very good job of depicting this in our, in our models, I don't think. Um, let me ask you this, just uh, and depending upon... Um, uh, how much economics you've, you've had, you may have just like different ideas on this. But um, in a competitive industry, um, would you say that a competitive industry is characterized by homogeneous products or by differentiated products? See, we have this model that we teach where competitive industries produce homogeneous products. But that's not a conclusion out of that competitive model. It's an assumption that we make in the model. And why do we make that assumption in the model? Well, it's because, and again, depending upon how much economics you have, you'll see how this works. But we have the, this model of the representative firm that produces a certain amount of output Q. And then we add together the output of all the firms in the market to get the amount of output Q that's produced in the total market. So if we're going to add up the output of all the firms to get the market output, well, as they say, you can't add apples and oranges. So we assume the firms are producing a homogeneous product so that we can add them up to get what's produced in the market. You think the fast food industry is a competitive industry? It's really competitive, right? Those firms are out competing. You know, Wendy's trying to add bacon to more and more stuff and, you know, McDonald's introducing these new products and everything. In fact, product differentiation is a competitive strategy. It's one of the ways that firms compete with each other. In fact, product differentiation is the engine of economic progress. That firms are all the time looking for ways that they can improve their products, that they can attract customers from other producers... They differentiate their products to try to make themselves more attractive to consumers. And when they do that, it really doesn't benefit you just to make your product different. Because when you make your product different from your competitors, you're just as different from them as they are from you. So there's no real advantage to just differentiating your product. But if you can make it better, then you can get a competitive advantage. And so it's these firms all the time looking for ways to differentiate their product to get a competitive advantage that leads to economic progress. That's where these innovations enter into the economy. So, so firms always have to be looking for ways to innovate so they can keep up with their competition and, and maybe surpass uh, their competition. Um, 
One of the things Henry Ford is semi-famous for uh, for saying is uh, uh, when he was selling his Model T, which was at one time by far the best-selling automobile in the world, he said, you can have any color car you want as long as it's black. Boxers cheaper on the assembly line just to paint every car the same color and send them off. Uh, and meanwhile, uh, he was saying that in response to his competitor, General Motors, uh, that was uh, uh, selling cars in, with different colors. Uh, consumers like that. Uh, and while Ford did say at one time, you can have any color car you want as long as it's black, he changed his mind when he started losing market share to the, the uh, innovations of, uh, of General Motors. You, know, you, you look at the way that, that, uh, that uh, innovation occurs in, uh, in industry and you see you can't stand still. You have to be entrepreneurial if you want to continue uh, making profits. And a great example of that is the computer industry where there's been so much uh, innovation. Um, but um, you know, if, you, if you go back to the 1960s, IBM's dominated the computer industry. Um, and uh, so, uh, in fact, uh, something I want to mention a little bit later, uh, the Justice Department accused them of monopolizing the computer industry because they had such big market share. Um, but uh, as you moved into the uh, 1980s and 1990s, uh, IBM lost a lot of market share uh, to a new type of computer that you may not even be familiar with, the, the mini computer. Have you ever even heard of mini computers? Uh, the big company that was selling them back then was Digital Equipment Corporation, DEC. And mini computers, they weren't as big as a mainframe. You know, a mainframe, it'd fill a whole room. You know, and you had to have a special climate-controlled room to, for the mainframe computer. But there's a lot of stuff people wanted to do with computers that could be done on smaller, less powerful, less expensive computers. And so uh, DEC and other companies came in with these mini computers. They're about the size of a refrigerator, uh, but uh, a lot smaller and a lot less expensive than the mainframe. And IBM lost a lot of market share uh, to the point where actually in the early 1990s, some people were predicting IBM was going to go out of business. And the reason you haven't heard of DEC is because, like IBM, they hung on to that mini-computer market as PCs began to be introduced, where, you know, there's a lot of stuff uh, people wanted to do on uh, computers that could be done on PCs rather than uh, mini-computers. Uh, and so DEC is trying to cling to their profitable mini-computer market, uh, continue losing market share as uh, people started uh, shifting their work to PCs. Uh, eventually, uh, DEC, uh, on their last legs, ended up being bought by Compaq, uh, which was then later bought by Hewlett Packard. Um, so, uh, so you see, you know, companies that get uh, uh, fixated on their current production, uh, whether it's IBM and their mainframe computers, uh, whether it's Henry Ford who will sell you any color car you want as long as it's black, uh, unless you're innovative and entrepreneurial, even the most successful firms are going to end up losing market share and are going to end up losing business. So entrepreneurship is absolutely essential to the survival of firms. And that's a good thing because it's this entrepreneurship that drives economic progress. Now, if entrepreneurship is, is fighting and acting on these profit opportunities, where do these profit opportunities come from? Uh, let me give you a taxonomy of, of, of three things. First of all, entrepreneurial opportunities can come from disruptions in markets. Uh, so, uh, you know, for example, a hurricane comes and hits the Gulf Coast, and so uh, gasoline ends up being in short supply, and now the price is uh, uh, potentially higher, and people might be able to profit from a disruption uh, in the market. Or there's unseasonably cold weather in central Florida that freezes some of the orange crop, uh, which then makes oranges more scarce and more valuable, uh, opening up entrepreneurial opportunities for people who have oranges and for people who are selling things that are substitutes for oranges. Uh, so disruptions um, 
in, in markets, factors that disequilibrate a market can lead to entrepreneurial opportunities. Um, another source of entrepreneurial opportunities, m- maybe more significant, um, is... Uh, Enhancement of production possibilities. Uh, if, if you have um, uh, uh, production possibilities are enhanced, uh, maybe through new, new technology or something like that, uh, then there might be an entrepreneurial uh, opportunity. Uh, also, if, uh, if income grows just to, through the process of economic growth, that's going to open up markets for goods that might not have been available uh, uh, before. Uh, so another source of entrepreneurial opportunities. But another big source of entrepreneurial opportunities is the actions of entrepreneurs themselves. That one entrepreneurial act opens up a whole bunch of other entrepreneurial opportunities. Uh, so um, one thing that like, you might find handy sometimes uh, on your computer is a wireless mouse. You, know, so you don't have to fool with the cord or anything. You can use a wireless mouse. What a great idea. And where did the opportunity for the wireless mouse come from? You know, it, it wasn't lying around long. You know, I mean, once the, the computer, the graphic interface was uh, uh, invented uh, with, the, with the mouse, people saw an opportunity for the wireless mouse. And where did that graphical computer interface come from? Well, after a certain amount of computing power had uh, been generated, so computers were powerful enough that they could run that interface through the development of microprocessors, that opened up the opportunity for the Windows operating system. Uh, And even the the PC itself, uh, the developers of the microprocessor who invented the microprocessor at Intel, they weren't picturing that their microprocessors were going to power personal computers, but rather once those microprocessors were made, other innovators saw, hey, you know, we could use this as the as the brain of a computer. So one entrepreneurial action leads to other entrepreneurial uh, opportunities. So we have a continual uh, growth in uh, in uh, uh, entrepreneurial activity. Uh, So the more the more entrepreneurial an economy is, the more entrepreneurial opportunities are created. In the, the types of equilibrium models that we tend to teach in the classroom, there aren't that much in the way of entrepreneurial opportunities because we always depict markets that are always in, uh, in equilibrium. Uh, but that's, uh, you know, that's not really that realistic if you think about the way the actual economy works and the way uh, economic progress takes place. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little economics joke. It's probably only funny to economists, and you may have heard it before. But uh, those two economists are walking down the sidewalk, and, uh, and one says, well, look, there's a $20 bill on the sidewalk. And the other one says, no, it couldn't be. If there was, somebody would have picked it up. Um, <clears throat> And see, I told you it wasn't that funny. Um, but, the, but see, this sort of funny to economists because in the models that we have, you know, the models are in equilibrium where there aren't any entrepreneurial opportunities left. You know, so, um, you know, essentially our models are telling you there can't be any $20 bills lying on the sidewalk. And yet entrepreneurs are looking for those opportunities uh, and, and finding them all the time. <clears throat> So in order to have economic progress, we need to have entrepreneurship. In order to have entrepreneurship, we need to have uh, the environment of entrepreneurship. We need to have property rights that are protected. Uh, We need to have rule of law. Uh, We need to have low barriers to trade, low taxes, low regulatory barriers to getting in uh, in and out of business. Uh, And when we don't have those things, People with uh, entrepreneurial impulses then have the incentive to try to take advantage of the system through, uh, in order to use their entrepreneurial uh, impulses to transfer resources from some people to other people. The functioning, in the functioning of a market economy, profit and loss is a crucial factor. If somebody in an economy takes resources that are worth a certain amount 
and then combines them into output that's worth more than the original resources, they're adding value to the economy. We should reward them. And in a market economy, we do. That's what profits are. Right? Is the, the value of the output over and above the value of the inputs. If somebody in an economy takes resources of a certain value and combines them into output that's worth less than the original resources, they're taking value away from the economy. We should penalize them. And in a market economy, we do. That's what losses are. Right? Is the, 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 the uh, uh, lower value of the output compared with the value of the inputs that they purchase. So, so profit and loss plays a crucial role in the operation of a market economy. Um, let me give you a, a couple of, of, of applications here so we can sort of think about this in the context of our economy. Uh, over the last decade or so, people have accused Microsoft of monopolizing the computer industry. Is Microsoft a monopoly? Well, there are a couple of ways we could look at that. One is from a static viewpoint, we could say, look, they have dominant market share, uh, they have big profits that seem to indicate monopoly profits, uh, you know, maybe, um, uh, I mean, one uh, controversial issue is whether they're excluding competitors uh, from the market, so, you know, maybe uh, by some ways of looking at things, they're a monopolist. But if we think about this, looking at it in a more entrepreneurial way, you know, I mean, it's interesting that the market that I, that Microsoft is accused of monopolizing is the same market that IBM was accused of monopolizing in the 1960s. And how did IBM get their huge market share? It was through innovation, through their IBM 360 computer, which was the first multitasking operating system for uh, mainframe computers. It was a huge project at IBM, so much so that the people at the company at the time referred to that IBM 360 operating system for their mainframe. They referred to it as, you bet your company. Because they were spending so much to develop it, they thought, if this doesn't work, the company's going to go under. But it did work. And they were so far ahead of everybody else in the, in the industry, they ended up with a huge market share and reaped profits. Uh, now, well, now, were they a monopoly? I mean, one way to look at it is they were entrepreneurial innovators. It was the lure of profits that led them to that innovation. And the profits that they made in the 1960s were the reward for their entrepreneurial innovation. And we might make the same argument for Microsoft in the 1990s and up into, into this decade. You know, that Bill Gates saw that entrepreneurial opportunity and brought that operating system to market and, and did so in a way that satisfied the demands of consumers. Of course, Apple has a similar operating system. They had a different marketing strategy, right? To get the Apple operating system, you have to buy the Apple computer. So they bundled the hardware and the software. And Bill Gates' marketing innovation, sort of like Ray Kroc had a in marketing innovation with the hamburger, uh, Bill Gates' marketing innovation was, we'll sell the operating system separately and you can put it on whatever computer that you want. Uh, and it turned out to, to pay off. So, you know, I don't know, is Microsoft a monopoly? Well, there, there are two views on it. But the more, the more we look at the economy as entrepreneurial, the more it looks like Microsoft is getting the, the returns from their entrepreneurial innovation. Uh, now, uh, let me mention uh, uh, one other uh, issue here. Uh, this is a more contemporary uh, issue, but you know, I'm trying to emphasize the crucial role of profits and losses to entrepreneurship in the economy. Last summer, when gas prices were up around $4 a gallon or more, when he was campaigning for president, President Obama said he wanted to put a windfall profits tax on oil companies. Gas prices are down. He's since backed off on that. But last summer, you know, there was a big call for windfall profits taxes on, on oil companies. They're making so much profit. Now, our auto industry seems to be collapsing. General Motors and Chrysler especially uh, look like they're in dire 
uh, financial straits. The Bush administration stepped in, gave them a, a bailout, at least to tide them over to now the Obama administration who says they're going to support and bail out the auto industry. If you think about the crucial role of profit and loss in the economy, the incentives that are set up, and you look at those two events, and what are we doing? We're saying if you're a successful, profitable company that's providing goods that people want and adding value to the economy, we're going to penalize you. And if you're a failing company that's using up resources that cost more than the value of your output to consumers, we're going to subsidize you and support you. We want you to stay in business. Are those the kind of incentives that we want to have to have an entrepreneurial economy, to have economic progress? So I want to close by thinking about that idea in a critical way. I mean, here we are. It's the first day of the Obama administration. Um, and uh, so, so, I mean, we can, can hardly point the finger at President Obama. But look, at, at President Bush, supposedly fiscally conservative President Bush, uh, with the $700 billion bailout of the financial industry, who knows where that money is going. But, you know, it was targeted to failing firms. Uh, with the uh, Bush administration's uh, bailout of the auto industry, uh, uh, Congress will continue that. The Obama administration will continue that. I'm a little bit concerned right now that we might be seeing some fundamental changes in the nature of incentives in our economy. I hope I'm wrong. I hope that's not, not the case. Uh, I hope that the way this turns out is we can look back on it in a few years and say this was a temporary, one-time situation that we entered on on an emergency basis. It's not business as usual. But what I'm afraid of is that we've set a precedent in the past few months that we're going to continue over the next few months that's going to permanently change the nature of incentives in the economy. That's going to take away from some of the lure of profits that lead people to be entrepreneurial, that lead to economic progress. And in its place is going to put incentives for firms to go to the government to look for support, to look for profits, to look for resources. That will give firms an incentive to be more predatory, to look to you, the taxpayers, for their support, rather than to try to satisfy their customers. And if that happens, we'll have a, a reduction in the amount of entrepreneurship in our economy. We'll have a reduction in the amount of economic progress, and we'll all be worse off as a result. Like I say, I, you know, I hope that's not the case, and I'm speaking about this as these events are only a few months old. Five years from now, I hope we look back and see it as a temporary aberration, but my fear is that we're undergoing some fundamental institutional changes that are going to undermine some of the foundations of our market economy. So I will close with that, and I would be happy to take uh, any questions that uh, anybody has, if questions, comments, or anything. So um, I'm, I'm not an economics, but are you saying that we shouldn't tamper with the economy at all and just kind of let it flow how it flows, or just not put any kind of... Uh, Switching incentives, uh, inverting, you know, punishing entrepreneurs. Yeah, I think we shouldn't tamper with the economy. Now, it's not a bad thing to have rules that businesses have to live by. Uh, sometimes those rules don't have to be imposed by government. Uh, stock markets, uh, you know, New York Stock Exchange makes rules for companies that are going to be listed on the stock exchange and so forth. But you want to have an environment where firms have an incentive to produce goods and services that satisfy their customers. Uh, and I do think it's a bad thing to intervene the way that we've intervened recently. Um, 
because it exactly undermines the incentives to be productive. Uh, and I also question whether it's necessary. I mean, you know, I mentioned the case of the auto industry. Uh, my own personal feeling on it is we would have been best served if the Bush administration had let the auto companies go bankrupt. That doesn't necessarily mean they won't be producing automobiles. They can go into Chapter 11 bankruptcy and reorganize. Uh, when I flew in here, uh, I flew in on Delta Airlines which you may remember was bankrupt a few years ago. They declared Chapter 11 bankruptcy. They uh, restructured uh, their debts. They renegotiated some contracts with their unions. Uh, and now they're back up, not back up and flying. They always were flying. They never quit flying their planes. They didn't lay off their pilots. They didn't lay off their flight attendants. They didn't lay off their, their mechanics. They continued producing through Chapter 11 bankruptcy. If Chrysler and General Motors, I think Ford is in better shape than the other companies financially, if Chrysler and General Motors are viable companies, they can go into Chapter 11 bankruptcy, reorganize, restructure their union contracts, restructure their debts, and come out healthier auto producing uh, companies. Uh, maybe they're not viable, in which case they can sell off their assets. Uh, you know, even if they went bankrupt, I am pretty confident 10 years from now you'd be able to buy a Chevy Silverado if you really wanted one. Maybe not made by General Motors, but it's a valuable brand name that, you know, they could sell to, uh, to somebody else. But by bailing them out the way that we did, uh, all we're doing is prolonging the current structure that's losing them money. So when the eventual end comes, they'll be that much further in the hole. Uh, so, um, so I think it was counterproductive uh, uh, what we did. Yeah. Uh, I think it's probably not true. Um, first of all, we need to distinguish the financial sector from banks, because if you're talking about the FDIC, they insure banks, but not other financial institutions. Um, there is a uh, recent report put out by uh, some economists at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. And they look very skeptically at this idea of a financial crisis. What they do is actually look through the numbers in financial markets. They look at things like commercial paper markets, mortgage markets, interbank lending. And there has been a slowdown in those markets. But the economy is in a recession. So you would expect for there to be a slowdown. But for, for all of these markets, if you look at monthly figures and compare with the year before, in all cases, they're higher. You know? So it doesn't really look like there's a financial crisis. There's a recession. No doubt the economy is limping along. We're in a recession. But that's different from a financial crisis. And the evidence on the financial crisis, you know, the way I read it, is mixed. Now, when you look at the banking sector, one of the issues was providing liquidity to banks. Uh, and the way the Federal Reserve has always done that before, um, if the Federal Reserve got actively involved, was through the discount window, making loans to member banks of the Federal Reserve system. And I don't see why that wouldn't have been perfectly adequate this time, too. Uh, instead, what the Federal Reserve has done, I shouldn't say instead, I should say in addition, what the Federal Reserve has done was to directly buy assets and take equity interest in those banks. So they provided them liquidity by taking equity interest in the banks. I see no reason why the Federal Reserve should have been involved in taking equity interest in banks. And another thing the Federal Reserve's done is it's bought financial instruments from non-bank institutions. This is unprecedented in the history of the Federal Reserve. And it's hard for me to see the evidence that there is good reason to do this. Now, it is clear that a lot of investment banks were in financial trouble because of the subprime mortgage, uh, the securitized mortgages uh, that they held. 
And that was because of bad decisions on their, on their part. They made risky decisions. They were gambling. Uh, you probably know they were heavily leveraged, like in the neighborhood of 30 to 1, you know, which meant that they borrowed like $30 for every $1 of assets uh, that they had. So when you're heavily leveraged like that, the market doesn't have to turn very far against you before you know, you, your net worth is negative. Uh, they made some risky bets that didn't pay off, and I don't see why they should have been... Uh, have gone bankrupt as a result of that. Now, you know, there's a question about the amount of, of liquidity that they provide to the market and what that would have done uh, to business. But I don't really see that, that their role was essential. I mean, they do provide a lot of capital to business in one sense. But in another sense, these financial institutions are financial intermediaries. You know, like Bear Stearns, Merrill Lynch, Lehman Brothers. They don't create liquidity. What they do is match up borrowers and lenders. You know, some people want to borrow, some people want to lend. You go through a financial institution to match up borrowers and lenders. And there are other financial institutions that were in a position to step in and undertake that activity should those investment banks go under. Uh, so no doubt those investment banks were in financial trouble. And, you know, one thing I wonder about is, uh, that, you know, Henry Paulson, his background is investment banking. Uh, you know, he's a Goldman Sachs guy. And I wonder if he was looking a lot through the eyes of an investment banker rather than stepping back and looking at the whole of financial markets when he made his decision. Uh, and I'll also note, you know, when he, you know, he went to Congress and, and told them over the weekend, we need to vote on this and get this $700, $700 billion bailout. Um, now, Congress dragged their feet a little bit until they eventually passed it. And it was passed in order for the Treasury to buy those toxic securities from the financial institutions that held them. Well, it turned out that's not how we, we use the money at all. You know, instead he's using it to take an equity interest in there. So, you know, he got, he got $700 billion out of Congress, supposedly to do one thing. Now he ends up doing something else with the money. There's still a lot of that money left. And so now the Obama administration is debating how they're going to use the money that's already been approved by Congress. So um, it doesn't appear there was as much of a crisis, at least as Secretary Paulson made it appear. And certainly it doesn't appear that he needed $700 billion dollars because half of the money already, at this point in time, is unused, even as we go into the Obama administration. So it seems like what you're saying is the way this has been developed is that the financial crisis is really the case. Yeah, I mean, just from the evidence I've seen, I don't see the evidence of a financial crisis, in that if you look at the numbers... And this is, and I'm taking a lot of this from a report that was done by economists at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. You know, they looked at the numbers and they, you know, the employees of the Federal Reserve Bank said, it just doesn't appear that there was a problem in those financial markets. There was a slowdown for sure. But as far as the liquidity crisis, it's just, it's hard to see that it existed. And certainly one of the things that exacerbated the economic downturn in the fall was, Secretary Paulson and Chairman Bernanke saying that there's a crisis, you know, because then all of a sudden, I mean, that freezes people's activities right there. They're thinking, uh-oh, you know, we better be careful. We better hang on to our assets because we're coming into a, a crisis, you know, along with, coupled with um, Secretary Paulson telling financial institutions we're going to buy up these toxic securities. So if you're holding those securities and you're thinking, I need liquidity, I could sell these securities, you'll be thinking, but why should I sell them now? Because the Secretary of the Treasury has told me he'll pay more for them if I wait. So that further ties up financial markets. So I think, uh, you know, what uh, just our policy response in the fall exacerbated the crisis, the, the, the crisis atmosphere anyway. One more quick question. I'm just curious, what is your um, I guess my answer would be not unfavorable. The question was what my opinion is of Obama's financial advisors, uh, and I would say not unfavorable. Uh, he picked people who 
uh, have ties to the Democratic Party, to the Clinton administration from the past. He picked people who are well-known, who are, are, are credible people. Uh, so, I mean, that's what you would expect. They're, they're people who are in line with... Um, Yeah, I think they're solid. They're solid people. I mean, I, their views are probably different from mine in a number of ways, but they're people who are knowledgeable about the economy. And I don't think he's picked the extreme, you know, people on the extreme left, which you know you might be concerned with if you're on the extreme right. Uh, so, I, you know, I think he's made credible picks.